COVID-19 is threatening lives and economies across the globe. As the UK government enforces social distancing to slow the spread of the virus, a sharp slowdown in economic activity is not only inevitable, but necessary from a public health perspective. Ministers have been charged with the unenviable task of ensuring that hit and pause now doesn't lead to long lasting damage. The Chancellor has committed to doing whatever it takes to see the UK through the crisis. The Treasury's package includes £330 billion of zero interest loans and loan guarantees for businesses, business rates relief and cash grants for retail, hospitality and leisure companies, £10,000 cash grants to all small businesses and a three month mortgage holiday for those in distress. More government action, we are told, will come with employment support. But will this be enough to ensure the economy can recover? What, if anything, could the government be doing differently to reduce the damage? Joining me, the IEA's digital manager, Darren Grimes, for the second of a two part podcast series is Dr. Steve Davies, head of education here at the Institute, to give his take on the government's economic response to the coronavirus crisis. Hi, Steve. Hello there, Darren. Now, Steve, thanks for joining me again uh, virtually. Now, last week, you uh, earlier this week, rather, you shared your fascinating insight into the history of pandemics and the parallels with what we're seeing today. Now, listeners can catch up on that in the IEA's on the IEA's website in the film section or at live from lordnorthstreet.podbean.com. So it looks like we're heading towards a severe economic downturn. Would you agree with our economics fellow Julian Jessup that the slowdown will be like a handbrake turn rather than a slow motion car crash? Well, hopefully, yes, that's indeed what the government uh, is aiming for in the measures that it's taken. The thing to realise is that what we're seeing here is a major supply side shock. In other words, what is happening here is that the actual output of goods and services is going to decline very, very sharply. This is not initially a demand side shock. So there's lots of people who would dearly love to go to the pub still, but the pub is closed. And so therefore the services the pub would normally be providing, the goods it would normally be selling, they're not available. So this is something which the government has actually, through its social distancing and lockdown measures, deliberately brought about in order to check the spread of the virus. Now, what it means, of course, is that therefore the supply side of the economy is massively reduced. There's a huge reduction in that. This will have a knock-on effect on demand to the extent that people lose their jobs or just don't have the income coming in. Uh, But the measures the government's taking are not about uh, keeping that demand level up. What they're about is preserving the supply side of the economy. Now, it's important to understand what that means. Uh, In one sense, the assets are still going to be there when all this is over. Those pubs are still going to be there. Uh, The factories are still going to be there. The land is still going to be there and all the rest of it. But in many ways, what makes those assets productive is the human relations uh, that are built around them and with them. A pub of itself is not productive. What makes it productive is the relationships with suppliers, the breweries and others, the staff relationships that mean the pub can actually provide a service. And the great risk of this uh, necessary slowdown is that it will disrupt or even uh, possibly destroy much of that human infrastructure that's the key part of the supply side. If that is allowed to happen, then the process of reconstruction after the uh, arrest, if you will, uh, will be much, much more drawn out and much more difficult. It would not be a handbrake turn in that case. It would be more like hitting the brakes and slamming into a brick wall at the same time, which is mm-hmm. not what you want. Uh, so what the government has done, the measures it's undertaken, they are essentially about keeping things like firms, uh, supply side human institutions in existence through the slowdown so that when we can finally get out of this, uh, the pubs can reopen and they can you know, resume selling drinks to the hordes of people who will no doubt flock there. Uh, so there might then actually be a very sharp rebound because at that point 
all of that pent up demand will suddenly find expression. Now that will bring its own problems, uh, but the time to deal with those problems is when we actually face them. Right now, uh, the challenge facing the ministers, a very difficult one, as you say, uh, is to work out how to reduce the spread of the virus, but at the same time, keep as much of the infrastructure of the economy in place as possible. Do you think there are any inconsistencies with classical liberals backing such government intervention during a public health emergency? No, I do not think so. Um, I had a tweet a few days ago where I made this point. The point is that an emergency situation, by definition, is not the situation in which the normal rules that you would apply most of the time uh, work or apply. You have to do things that you would not normally do. Uh, Conversely, uh, the kind of things that you do in an emergency are not the kind of things that you can do regularly or would want to do regularly. You cannot justify uh, a policy or a course of action by saying, well, uh, you know, that's what we did in an emergency, therefore it must be okay. I mean, to take an extreme case, suppose you are in a lifeboat uh, and the only way to stay alive is to actually eat one of the people in the lifeboat. you might say, well, yes, that is justified because better that one person gets eaten than everybody in the lifeboat starts. But you don't then say after the event, well, what this shows is that eating people is a good idea because, (laughs) hey, we did it in the lifeboat. So similarly, I think the kind of measures the government is taking are completely justified on classical liberal grounds because we're in an emergency situation where the normal rules are suspended. Uh, The What you can do, though, is to say that within that emergency, you should uh, apply the rules for dealing with an emergency situation in a certain way. So, for example, you do not want to do things in the context of an emergency, which then become permanent Mm -hmm. if you would not wish that to happen. Uh, You try to do as little damage to the institutions of a liberal society uh, and a free economy as you possibly can uh, in the measures that you take. So you still have rough rules of thumb that guide you uh, while you're in the emergency and having to act in a way that you wouldn't normally do. I mean, usually when faced with an economic slowdown, governments across the world now seek to encourage spending. What do we make of the government's economic response to COVID-19? Do you think they are appropriate? I do think they're appropriate. Now, to address the point that you uh, mentioned, uh, what you do not want to do at the moment is to get people spending money, uh, because the whole point of the measures is to actually shut down a large part of the economy so that people don't meet each other. So having them spend more money actually is the last thing you want them to do right now. So this is not a recession because we're going to face a very sharp recession. Uh, Many estimates now say more than 20 percent fall in GDP in the second quarter of this year. This is not a recession where what you want to do is to boost demand and have people buy things. As I said before, what you want is to actually keep the supply side of the economy in place for when we come out of the other end uh, of this tunnel. Now, I do think that the measures the government has taken are broadly speaking, the correct ones for what is happening. You can argue uh, that maybe there are gaps in what they've done, such as provision for the self-employed, which is, I gather, being addressed today, uh, and things of that sort. Uh, But the, uh, you know, broadly, I think they are on the right lines. I think the big question they are going to have to think about, though, uh, in the future is the question of Uh, what to do about debt and debt obligations. Now, you mentioned that the government has provided a large amount of uh, zero interest loan facility for firms. Now, that may prove to be sufficient. The problem is this. If the uh, effect of the pandemic goes on for too long, uh, A, that may not be enough, but also companies, regardless of what help the government could give them, will come out in a severely weakened condition. Mm. And what happens if those are cast as loans, they will have to be written up in the assets and liabilities accounts of those firms as a liability. And that will make their credit worthiness very, very weak because their their balance sheet will look very structurally unsound. So I suspect that if this uh, crisis goes on for more than a few months, Uh, the government will have to look at significant measures of debt forgiveness that may be converting those zero interest loans into simple grants uh, or rescheduling the payments over such a long term that they're effectively forgiven, in which case, why not do that anyway? Also, I think this is going to trigger quite a lot of debt defaults in the private sector. Uh, There's been a report today 
that one of Britain's largest uh, owners of shopping centres, which was already in pretty significant financial problems because of the uh, change in the retail sector, mm -hmm. move to online purchasing, is now facing a total collapse in revenues because a lot of its tenants are simply refusing to pay rent. So Primark, for example, has announced it's not going to pay any rent to its landlords. Uh, and what this means is I think that a large amount of debt of that kind, corporate debt, uh, is going to prove to be unsound. And I think the government is probably going to have to bite the bullet sometime towards the end of this year and simply write off a large amount of that debt and forgive it. Uh, now that will then force it to think about how to handle that and what to do with the financial sector, which is a whole big additional question. But that's one of the questions they will have to face down the line, I think. Well, what are the speaking of facing things down the line? What are the long term implications of these measures, if if any, likely to be? Well, that's a good question. It depends really on how things work out. If the um, if things work as the government hopes, and as I hope, uh, then these will prove to be temporary emergency measures brought in to keep the economy on life support, if you will, uh, while it's in the artificially induced coma that the government's measures have brought on. And they can then be fairly rapidly uh, withdrawn once economic life returns to normal and we get quite a strong rebound, almost certainly, as I said, a V-shaped recession as the sort of technical term has it. Now, what may then happen, though, is that a lot of the money that's been pumped into the economy, the liquidity that the government has created, will lead to a lot of pent up demand being manifested. If we're not very careful, you could then have some quite serious inflation. So the government will need to think about what kind of steps it would take on the other side of this crisis. It might need to raise interest rates, for example. Uh, it might be be thinking about doing that anyway. Uh, it might need to claw back some of that money it's given out in one way or another, maybe through the tax system, maybe in some other way. But that's all really for the future. What I hope is that it will not bring about a major structural change in things like employment relations or the structural nature of the economy. Uh, and the way the measures are designed, in fact, is that they're not intended to do that. Uh, and I think that's that's true across the political spectrum. I think all the parties recognize that this is a, a kind of short-term one-off mm -hmm. measure. The places where we may get changes um, more speculatively are in areas like social and welfare policy, uh, where I think what this has done is to really highlight the weakness of the UK's income supplement based uh, welfare model. And so well, I think we are yeah. going to see quite a discussion about what we might do about that. I was about to ask, what are the implications for wel the welfare system? Because you hear there are proponents on the left and the right arguing that a solution for those struggling would be through a universal basic income, for example. Yes, indeed. Now, the, the thing is this. At the moment, the figures just show that there's been, as you would expect, an enormous, quite extraordinary increase in the number of people applying for universal credit. Uh, the problem with the way that uh, benefit works is that there's a waiting time of, I believe, it's five weeks before you actually get it, uh, which in the current situation is simply insupportable. Not to mention there's the practical administrative problem uh, that there just simply aren't enough people working in the uh, Department of Social Security to uh, deal with all these requests. So I think that it may well be that as a crisis measure, it basically the money is simply paid out in a way that makes it rather like a universal basic income. Now, what I think will happen is that um, as we come towards the end of this crisis, a lot of people on both left and right, as you say, both free market and socialist side will say, look, what this shows is that we need to actually get rid of the system of means tested benefits and replace it, because that's how it has to work, with a much more kind of universal benefit system, maybe a negative income tax, maybe a genuine universal basic income, some kind of universal income guarantee, which would completely replace not just uh, universal credit, but a whole raft of other benefits as well. On the other hand, I think there'll be a lot of pushback against that. And again, from both left and right, for various reasons. So I think we're going to have a really big debate about that in about a year's time, I imagine. Mm, yeah. I mean, what else is going on with the government's response apart from the, the income supporting ones? You know, what, what else is happening? Well, they're trying to essentially give support for firms uh, 
through a variety of means, through the tax system, through companies' house, uh, through local government offices and the like, to enable them to keep their connections alive, if you will. Uh, so that the, what the government is trying to do is to help firms, particularly small firms and medium sized ones, uh, to maintain relationships with their suppliers and customers, uh, not just by giving them money, uh, but by also if essentially freezing the relationship between those people so that uh, people don't find they are suddenly out of pocket because their supplier can't. Uh, pay them or meet what they need and therefore they cut that link and cut that connection. So apart from the sheer money funding side of it, the liquidity side of it, what the government is also trying to do uh, rather behind the scenes, uh, but nonetheless very importantly, is to preserve all the the other aspects of the commercial relationships that are out there basically uh, mm -hmm. between, as I say, employer and employee, supplier and um, buyer, this kind of thing. Uh, now that will that's probably an ongoing basis. I imagine the ministers in charge of this are going to have to uh, keep on doing this on an almost day by day basis. They'll probably have to face you know phones ringing off the hook in their offices. So I certainly don't envy them. Uh, but that's the other side of what they have to do. Mm. Now, finally, Steve, the chancellor said at a recent press conference that this is not the time for ideology for. This is not a time for ideology or orthodoxy, rather. Do you think that this crisis and the huge state support it has garnered will lead to a crisis among free marketeers and those in favour of a small state? Do you think we have we've, we've been pushed and I mean, you've been arguing for a long time that the the shift in uh, the well, the politics, the reshaping of British politics does not bode well for free marketeers and classical liberals. Mm. But do yeah. you think that this this merely fast uh, speeds up that realignment in British politics? Yes, I do think that. Uh, first of all, let me respond to what the Chancellor said. Uh, in one sense, I know what he means. He's saying we're in an emergency. We just have to agree with the, what we think is necessary to get through this emergency. And I agree with him on that. On the other hand, remarks like that are actually either naive or disingenuous because ideology, your view of what is right and proper as the way to run a society or the way a society should function, uh, doesn't simply go away because you're in the emergency. It will tend to uh, influence the view you take of those measures that you take to get through the emergency. Like I say, you don't want them to become permanent in some cases, for example, whereas if you have a different ideology, you might think, hey, this is a great chance to do something I've always wanted to do anyway and make it permanent. So it's a bit disingenuous to say the ideology has gone out of the window. Uh, what I think is happening is this. We're seeing the emergence, if you like, of a consensus. Now, the Conservative Party, which was already moving pretty rapidly away from uh, its free market position. You saw that in the 2017 election with Theresa May and Nick Timothy's platform. You saw it even more, I think, in the run up to and during the 2019 election. And now, of course, you're seeing it with knobs on in spades, so to speak. The Conservative Party, I think, is moving quite clearly away from its free market position and towards something much more like the kind of conservatism that we had in the central decades of the 20th century, I think. It's a kind of conservatism that would be familiar to Tory politicians of the 1950s or 1930s to people like Neville Chamberlain or for that matter his father. And I think that that is likely to continue. Now, that doesn't, however, mean that uh, the ideas of liberalism or the support for it amongst large parts of the population will go away. And so what I think is going to happen, uh, making a kind of very rough prediction, is that in about 18 months time to two years time, when the crisis is finally over, there will then be a huge argument about what having been done during the crisis should be made permanent or what kind of changes to uh, overall uh, economic philosophy, government policy should be made. This is the kind of big argument you always have at the end of a major war. So at the end of World War II, there were lots of people, including a majority of the Atlee government, who thought that things like identity cards, food rationing uh, and the like should be kept in place indefinitely. That the kind of management of the labour force that the Ministry of Labour had been given the power to do uh, quite rightly during the war should continue into the future. And there was then a huge argument between them and uh, their opponents, the Conservatives and the Liberals, 
over precisely those issues. And you had organizations like the British Housewives League, uh, which campaigned very strongly against the uh, persistence and maintenance of rationing and food rationing in particular uh, after the war. And eventually when the Conservatives won the election in 51, they actually did roll back a lot of those measures. So I think what we're likely to see is this, we're likely to see the emergence initially of a kind of apparent very broad consensus around what needs to be done right now. But then in a few years time down the line, 18 months time probably, we will see the emergence of a much bigger argument. And at that point, um, I would not be at all surprised to see a very clearly self-consciously kind of liberal poll emerge, which argues that, well, we're out of the emergency. We've certainly learned some things from it, but we do not want to make much of the powers that the government has been given or the kind of steps it's taken a permanent feature of our economic life. And we need to uh, you know, go revert to or perhaps move on to in some ways uh, a more liberal way of organising our, our life and our society. So I think at that point, the division will reappear very, very sharply and the consensus that exists at the moment, for good reasons, uh, will vanish. And what vehicle does that liberal movement manifest that's itself? Is that a question. political party? Or? That's, who knows? Uh, that's yeah. a very interesting question, uh, because the the Labour Party at the moment um, must be thinking that, well, good Lord, you know, all the policies we were advocating are now being put in place, <laughs> uh, which is... Yeah, Bernie sort of, Sanders I, just backed the Chancellor's uh, proposals. Indeed, I know. Uh, and so they must be feeling rather strange at the moment uh, and also really furious that they ridiculously had their electoral election for their leader take such a long time. Uh, but there's an interesting question of what happens afterwards, because a lot there is a large block of the public who will not want uh, the kind of controls and measures being taken now to continue. Now, the Labour Party doesn't represent them. Uh, that's a huge political opportunity for some other force, but it's pure speculation as to what might actually happen. We have no idea, really. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Steve. That was fascinating as ever. And I'm always in shock and awe at your encyclopedic brain and memory. But thank you very much. Your Twitter handle is at Steve Davies 365. That's right. Yes. yes. I would urge everyone to follow you for your insight and analysis, which is always top notch. And you can subscribe to this podcast and indeed video if you're watching it on YouTube on either Podbean or YouTube. Thank you very much for listening.